Welcome back to the podcast. I am joined by another guest. This is a special guest, Fraser Fernhead. And Fraser's been involved in a ton of different businesses. So he's going to bring a lot of his advice, tips, and experience to bear today. So, uh, Fraser, say hello to everybody. Fraser's from Blue Silver Consultancy. Tell us a little bit about you, Fraser. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me on the show, Dean. Um, yeah, very briefly, I went to a school that was big on education, ended up going into um, the law, um, not through any kind of passion for it, just because that was kind of what everyone in my school did. They either became dentists, doctors or lawyers or accountants, if they weren't that bright. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> Um, I think you've just offended a ton of accountants, by the yeah, way. Yeah, that's all right. That's my job. I like offending <laughs> people. Um, and so I ended up getting, going to the music industry as a lawyer and kind of got sidetracked. So I, I convinced myself to go into law because I wanted, um, I saw it as a route to getting into the film industry, but it was the 90s and the music industry in London was very vibrant. So I ended up going to the music industry. Um, quickly realised that wasn't really for me. It had its perks, believe me, had uh, lots lots of good parties and things like that, but the actual work wasn't something I particularly enjoyed. Um, and I kind of always wanted to work for myself. I've done various entrepreneurial endeavours ever since the age of 13, where I used to do magic shows for kids' parties. Um, I get paid pretty well for doing that um, on a Saturday afternoon. Um, I had the Hacienda in Manchester when I was 18. We had a big party there, about 1,200 people rocked up to that. And all the way through um, university, I'd, I'd put on plays and run clubs in, in a nightclub called The Warehouse in Leeds. So I always liked doing that sort of thing. And I just figured, look, really, my calling in life is to come up with ideas, start companies and um, do, my own, do my own thing, really, and not mm -hmm. work for someone else. That's kind of, a, I guess, I've always been driven by freedom and mm -hmm. just the ability to do what I want when I feel like doing it and not being beholden to what someone else thinks I should be doing. So ever since the year of 2000, I handed in my notice at my law firm. And since that time, I've, I've set up a, um, a number of different companies, um, sold some of them, some of them for seven figures. Um, some of them have gone very well. Some of them have, have not gone very well. And it's, it's, it's been a, well, it's been a bit of a roller coaster ride, if the truth be told. <laughs> but I've never, never regretted that, you know, if I'd stayed as a lawyer, yes, I would probably have a seven figure salary by now, be a partner in the firm and be very, have a very, very comfortable life. But you know what? My life isn't so bad as it is. I may not have that security, but I've always done what I want to do. And that's kind of more important to me. You, you've got on your LinkedIn header there that you're the battle scarred entrepreneur. And I, I, I like that because very often there's this veneer painted, you know, you've got your big, you know, um, um, Richard Branson's and people like that. Uh, and unless you dig deeper, you don't really see the mistakes and challenges and all of that. I think so. there's something about entrepreneurship and building a business where a lot of the struggles are hidden and people don't really talk about it. And so it can paint an unrealistic picture of what building a business is like. I think it, it does. You only ever see the surface of other people's lives or other people's businesses. So whether they're celebrities, whether they're you know, friends of yours who seem to have a seemingly happy marriage, or whether people who are running seemingly very successful businesses, you don't know the struggles they've had to get there because people don't talk about it, as you say, or not everybody talks about it. And you don't really know how they're doing or what problems they're having in their life. I mean, it's like the um, the little the story about the the duck who looks smoothly gliding over the pond, but madly scrabbling and underneath to to keep afloat. Um, I imagine there's a lot of people like that, and I, I think it's it seems to be opening up. There's a lot of people on LinkedIn, for example, talking about you know mental health struggles they've had at the moment and mm -hmm. stuff. And I think it's. Um, to some extent, at least, a good thing to get that sort of thing out there and, and have people talk about it and realise that it, it, it's tough being an entrepreneur. You know, it's, it's, it's quite lonely. You can only really relate to other entrepreneurs um, who are in that position because there's a lot of responsibility when the buck stops with you. Mm -hmm. You're responsible for your employees, you're responsible for your shareholders and your customers, and it's, it's, it can be hard. So... 
whilst we're talking down entrepreneurship, <laughs> um, you were talking earlier about you, you did the law thing, you went into the music industry, industry, but you always had this, this drive towards freedom. And there is more, sometimes life, if you look around, you go, you know, uh, we're probably going way too deep here, but what's the meaning of life? But actually, we all have this kind of inner thing or drive or purpose, if we want to call that, to say this is what we want to do. But I think a lot of people struggle to find it and know what it really is. Well, they absolutely do. I mean, I, I have a number of friends or I've got clients, but friends in particular who've kind of inherited family businesses and they've spent their whole life doing that business and they're you know, they have comfortable lives, but I know they're not happy doing what they're mm -hmm. doing. They don't, they don't, it's not their purpose. They do it for a living. And likewise, you know, I've, I've fallen foul of this on a number of times. I've started companies simply because I saw an opportunity to make some money. And, you know, I've learned it never really ends well because, you, you know, once you've got a reasonably comfortable life, you know, you're not struggling. Money is not that bigger motivator and if you haven't got a higher purpose something that makes you get up in the morning and look forward to the day and feel excited about it if you haven't got that higher purpose one when you hit obstacles you're likely to just give up and move on to something else because you haven't got anything above yourself that you're moving towards um, and two you you know how, how easy is it going to be to hire good quality staff and motivate them because you're going to be the one making most money as an entrepreneur. Um, you, you need to, I, I found in my last company, for example, we had a really good purpose, had a really, really strong vision for what I wanted that company to be. It's attracted really good quality team members. And we created a whole culture at that company where everyone loved coming to work. Everyone got on together. In fact, you know, people who left the company still socialize with people who are still there now. Um, I think it's very important to have a purpose, but you are right. Um, it's not something that is immediately obvious to people what that is. I mean, if you're a kind of a, a writer or an artist or a musician or something like that, then I think those sorts of people are seen as having a very definite purpose. But for people in kind of ordinary, shall we, for want of a better word, um, jobs, it's, it's sometimes hard to establish what your purpose is, but there are ways you can do it. Okay, so just to grill you a little bit, how do you find your purpose? Okay, well, there's, there's two things, really. Um, first of all, I'd like to, I mean, in terms of how you find your purpose, or have you got a purpose, let, let's just look at what someone is currently doing. I, I always like the story of, um, take two janitors, for example. And a lot of it can do a lot of it can be down to your perspective. If you've got two janitors and one of them looks at his job, his perspective on his job is gotta spend all day cleaning up after these annoying, messy kids, and he's not very happy with his job. Mm -hmm. The other guy thinks, Oh, I've got a really important job. I provide a really safe, clean environment so children can learn in. And that's his purpose. He's found his purpose because of his perspective on what he does. And um, there was an episode of The Sopranos, which, uh, are you a fan of The Sopranos? Or? You know what, I, I've, I, I've not got into that series yet, but it's got one of my favourite actors, uh, James Gald Gandolfini in it, yeah. and I, I need to watch it because it looks really good. Okay, so there's a scene in that where he's, he takes his daughters, they're doing a tour of colleges, and he takes her to a cathedral, and he's, you know, he, with a real sense of pride in his voice, he's telling her how his ancestors were the bricklayers and the stonemasons who built that cathedral. Now mm -hmm. you could look at them, they were just laborers, or no, these were the guys who built this amazing cathedral. And there's a little story about that, which I um, often relate to clients about three bricklayers, which is along the same sort of lines as we've been talking. And it's like, so the story goes, guys walking down the road and sees three guys laying bricks. And he says, the first one, he, oh, hi, what, what are you doing? And the guy goes, oh, you know, just, just laying bricks. He goes, oh, okay moves on to the second one. What, what are you doing? And the guy goes, oh, I'm, I'm building a wall. He goes, oh, that's good. And he moves on to the third one. And he goes, oh, what, what are you doing? He goes, I'm helping build a cathedral. So if you, you're talking 
about purpose in life and you want to create a great culture in your company, then you want to have your staff motivated by the fact they're building, to use the metaphor, a cathedral rather than laying bricks. Mm. Um, and I think that's that's vitally important. Again, that's you know that's why we had such a great culture at my last company, um, because people were really on board with what we were trying to achieve, what the vision of the company was. So what happens when, like, you said earlier about things don't end well when when people do things just because it's an idea or it's a money making opportunity. Are there any thoughts you would give to people where they realise they're in that space right now? Yeah, I think I think they have to take a step back and look at where they are, look at if they can change their perspective, like the janitor, and see what they're actually doing is providing value that they are making a valuable contribution but and also perhaps you know assess what their values are they look at their personal purpose in life what it is they want to achieve with their, their life is that business furthering their personal purpose in life is it in line with their values and if not i, I think the best thing to do is quit and do something do something else because if you're out of alignment with your values, as I, I found myself in, in that last company I was talking about, when I started it, big vision, really behind it, it's a great concept. Um, but I, I essentially, the whole idea was, um, because I was, way banks had screwed people over in the financial crisis, the property industry in particular, and lots of people I know had their assets seized even by the banks, even though they were making the interest payments, all sorts of stuff. I wanted to enable people to, create financial freedom through property investment without using the banks. And I created what was in effect the world's first property crowdfunding company. Wow. Unregulated industry at the time, or the way we did it was unregulated. Regulation came in, um, we had to change our business model to a peer to what's called a peer-to-peer -peer lending model. And it just didn't sit right with me. It took away the whole ethos of why I started the company. We'd, you know, in my mind, we, we became glorified money lenders um, mm. and a lot of problems ensued from that. And I just, I hated going to work for about three or four years because it was out of alignment with my values. And I, I felt really unhappy, stressed, um, was drinking quite heavily to cope, cope with it. And, you know, I just reached the point where I, I realized this, I don't want to be doing this in my life anymore. And mm. I've been studying with a, my mentor, Bob Proctor, and I, you know, I, I realized that the only way to be happy is to find what your purpose is in life and, and follow it. Even if it meant, you know, my shares at that time were worth about 8 million quid. Um, and I had about a thousand shareholders. We were managing 130 million pounds with the client's money. And I couldn't just walk away because I felt obligated, but I realized I couldn't stay doing that. Mm. So it took me a couple of years, but with the help of my mentor, I've got a plan into place, transitioned my way out of that business. Um, and I found something I really love doing, which is helping other entrepreneurs get their ideas off the ground and scale their companies. And that gives me a real sense of fulfillment because I, I think entrepreneurs are the real heroes of our economy. What do you think are the keys, if we want to call it, to scaling or growing a business? Well, I think 80% of success in any endeavor, whether that's sports, relationships, or business, is down to your mindset. Yes, kind of strategic implementation and hard work and effort is part of it, but 80% of it is undoubtedly mindset, maybe even more than that. So I'm talking about things like your, your attitude, the way you treat other people, um, your perspective on life, your beliefs about um, whether you're worth success, whether you can achieve that success, whether you've really established what it is that you want, um, your, your leadership qualities, your ability to um, influence other people and motivate them. All these things are fundamentally mindset issues. And my strong belief is one of the things that I've really Maybe if you told me this 15 years ago, I would have thought it was a bit woo-woo, but it's it's absolutely 100% true. And you, you listen to interviews with successful people, actors like Jim Carrey, Matthew McConaughey, 
Leonardo DiCaprio or people like Oprah Winfrey or sports people, Roger Federer, Novak Djokovic, everything. What separates them and what they readily always talk about is their mindset is the most critical factor in their success. And it's exactly the same in business. You know, you can, you can work as hard as you like, but if you're doing the wrong things, you have the wrong attitude, you're not focused, um, you're not going to succeed. So it's all down to mindset. And once you've got the right mindset in place and you've got your foundation there, then you can start tinkering with your marketing strategies and implementation and putting your systems and processes and all that into place. But mindset is the absolute critical foundation. Without it, everything else will fall down. See, I, it's interesting you say that. I can remember having a conversation with one of my clients and we were talking about their pricing and I looked at what they were selling and I was like, that seems awfully cheap for what they're doing. And obviously I didn't understand their market. It was like just them telling me, but it seemed very cheap. And I said, this seems like, I didn't say cheap because I'd offend them, but I said, this seems like awfully good value. Why? <laughs> and, and, and I said, why don't you charge more for this and the first reaction was because people won't pay it well that's down to belief isn't it yeah but it was like there was no evidence for that they didn't say oh we've we've actually tested it we know this they just said no instantly customers won't pay it well there's there's two things about that you, you know you your earning power is dependent upon the value you're providing and how the market perceives that value so if you want to charge more, you know, you, you have to provide good value and you have to present it in a way so people recognize the value that you are providing. And if you are providing that value, people will pay more for it. Mm. So, so when we're talking about this kind of mindset, because there is a lot of, I, I, I'm, and I'm not being kind of, critical to you here Fraser but there is a lot of woo woo around mindset like you know um, if you if you can imagine that you know the parking fairies will come and get come and get you a parking spot and you know if you, if you just think about it right you'll become a billionaire yeah where where's the balance in this where's the common sense approach because i think sometimes and this just might be me i see a lot of the woo woo that i immediately go as soon as somebody says the mindset thing i go oh and pull away from it because it's like you know, crystals and things. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I totally get that. I remember, um, I don't know if you ever watched Room 101 with, with Frank Skinner and um, mm -hmm. had Emma Thompson on there one day and she was trying to put um, positive thinking into, the, into Room 101. And I just think that that typifies people's um, kind of general attitude towards it. I think the, seek, the film and the book, The Secret, have got a lot, a lot to blame for that because... There seems to be a perception that the law of attraction is all about, you know, you just, you can sit there and think about whatever mani manifest riches without getting up off your ass and doing anything about it. And that's really not what the lesson was about, uh, what the film or the book should have been mm -hmm. about. The law of attraction is really a secondary law of the universe. And again, I, you may, some of your listeners may think this is a bit woo-woo, but I've, I've come to learn this by a lot of study, um, over the past few years that everything in the universe is controlled by law and there are certain laws they're immutable they operate at all times in all places and if you want to succeed you it will be a lot easier for you and um, well you can't succeed without applying the laws whether you're cognizant of the fact you're applying the laws is almost irrelevant you what would be called probably an unconscious competence but if you want to systemize a um, a system for success you have to understand how the laws of the universe work and there is a lot of scientific proof for the law of attraction but it doesn't mean you can just sit there manifesting things it means you will attract things when you are on the right it's, it, the law of attraction is basically the secondary law to the law of vibration and everyone you know to use the old hippie phrase gives out vibes and you have to be if you're on the right vibrational frequency you will attract things other things to you on that same frequency now there are frequencies all around us there are for example there are light frequencies there are radio waves television waves all these things that you can't see but we know exist and you just you can tune into them if you have a tv or a radio you can tune into that frequency and likewise if you're on the same frequency as certain things you will attract them to you and 
you know, I've looked into quantum physics a little bit. I don't pretend to fully understand it, but I, I've got a, a, a rudimentary grasp of some of the principles. Um, well, I think anyone who claims to understand quantum physics is probably lying. Um, but um, there is something to it, but it doesn't mean you can just sit there. See, science has proven if you focus on something, for instance, the, the, the old example, if you're thinking of buying a new car, that is in the forefront of your mind. You will start seeing cars like the one you want to buy. So if you want to buy a Porsche, for example, you will suddenly start, and you've got that in your mind, you will suddenly start seeing Porsches everywhere. They will suddenly be a lot more common than you ever imagined, and perhaps you decide you don't want one after all. Um, so it, it does work. It's, you know, Tony Robbins does this in his seminars. He says, right, everyone look for something the color brown. And all of a sudden you'll start seeing bit bits of brown all around you well then he says look for something red and suddenly start seeing red in fact he says you'll start seeing things that are actually brown but you'll try and class them as red um and you do you there is certain scientific thing behind it but yes I, there's a lot of woo-woo around it as well do you know um i can buy into that that the way you put that there because it is quite grounded it is a very sensible approach to what is um often uh put out into something that's you know sit there and tell yourself in the mirror you'll be a billionaire and eventually it'll come well that, the reason that doesn't work dean just to interrupt is if you go look in the mirror and, and tell yourself you're a billionaire unless you're elon musk or jeff bezos or similar it's just not true and you know it's not true so there's a massive disconnect mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean affirmations don't work yeah it means you have to do them in a certain way so if you say something like every day I am getting better and be I'm getting better and better in every way, every day and every every day and in every way I'm getting better and better and better. That is an affirmation that has been scientifically proven to work for people time and time again, because you are convincing your subconscious mind that that is occurring. If you just go, I'm a billionaire. Well, it's just not true. So mm -hmm. it's, it's going to go, it's not going to work. So there are ways you can use these principles affirmations positive thinking all these sorts of things to work for you but you have to learn to do them in the right way mm. uh, i just i want to add to this and then i want you i want to ask you kind of okay how do you set some steps almost to to move this forward from from affirmations and things like that but i can remember when i was um learning to drive i was horrendous at hitting the curb yeah, you know, I'd, I'd be changing gear and the car would drift towards the curb. <laughs> and I developed this obsession with avoiding the curb. And my driving instructor would constantly have to put his hand on the wheel and push me out away from the curb. And he said to me, what you focus on is where you'll go. So true. He said, if you keep doing this, you will consistently have to keep avoiding the curb and i was like you know when you have those moments where there's something deep have been said but like there's a surface level conversation happened but there's something kind of quite deep there clicks yeah and it's like some people do spend their life avoiding the curb yeah well don't think of a pink elephant <laughs> oh don't say that <laughs> and what can you do you immediately think of a pink elephant and it's yeah people avoid the curb people avoid try and avoid debt they try and avoid poverty but because they're thinking about their bills and things like that the whole time they just attract more and more of what they don't want so that's why positive thinking does work if you are focused on the kind of life that you want to achieve the kind of business that you want to have then that is what you you draw things towards you because of that if you're focused on struggle and strife and bills and debt and hardship that's what you're going to attract to yourself and that is the law of attraction and that is how it works okay so uh, somebody wants to change things somebody wants to scale their business somebody wants to feel the benefit of living their life the way they want to or the way they would like to what are some of the things that they need to be doing because if they're frustrated at the moment they're maybe even disappointed maybe even going this it would have been easier to have a job than do this yeah <laughs> what are some of the things what are the some of the things that they should be doing now and what what action should they be taking if they're in that place 
do you know what the best thing you can try and do rather than improve your external circumstances um and work on your job or something like that is work on yourself so you know that really is if you want to increase your value in the marketplace you need to become more valuable and you do that by awareness study education knowledge and improving your personal skills so the first thing you need a direction you need you need to find a purpose you need to think about what makes you feel alive you know what are your natural strengths what can you do that puts you into that flow state we hear athletes talk about and i'm sure you've experienced it and we all have to some degree when you're doing something you love like for me it's writing when i'm writing i can look at my clock and four or five hours have gone past and i haven't even noticed the time going you know and another thing as well it's it's really important you know, you know you've got your um maslow's hierarchy of needs and once you you know you're able to survive you've got your bills paid you're financially reasonably secure you know, money becomes unimportant or less important to people anyway. And you start to look for things like personal fulfillment. How can you contribute to society? How can you help other people? So one, one exercise I go through with my clients to find their purpose is, so three, uh, there are a few of them, but there's a, the one I quite, I, I like the most, it's called three questions, three most important questions. So you look at what experiences would you like to have in your life? okay and you, you write those down in a column spend a, a minute or two doing that what would you like to do in order to grow and develop as a person spend a couple of minutes writing those things down and then what would you like to do to contribute um to society or the world in general and then when you've got all those things down then you know that gives you a really good basis for trying to figure out what it is you want to do with your life um so i think once you've got your purpose then you know that that's the main step then you need to work on what we call shifting your paradigms okay <laughs> getting getting rid of virus codes creating the right habits because i think one of the biggest turning points in my life was when i read a book actually it wasn't a book it was an audio audio program i used to listen to in my car but i subsequently bought the book um two books actually one one's called the compound effect by darren hardy and another book that's probably equally as good along pretty much identical lines called The Slight Edge by Jeff Olson. And, you know, without blowing my own trumpet, I'm, well, uh, other people seem to regard me as being pretty smart. And I always thought that being smart was great and, I, you know, having good ideas was enough to be able to accomplish anything. And I had some early successes which kind of bolstered those kind of deluded views of um, the world. And it's just not true. You know, being smart, or hard work or having some money behind you will only take you so far the fact of the matter is the secret of success i think it was albert gray who said this is successful people do those things that failures don't do and they don't like doing them but they do them anyway so to put it another way the secret for success is to is to develop the right habits and do them consistently day in and day out, whether or not you like doing them. And after a period of time, you'll become so used to them. It's like, you know, being taught to brush your teeth when you're a kid. You didn't like the taste of toothpaste, but your parents made you do it. And after a month or so, you, you know, you don't even think about it. You just do it naturally. And the secret of success is to do those things every day, those sorts of things that are easy to do, but easy not to do. And what separates the failures from the successes are those people who do them every day. And you don't have to be that clever. You don't necessarily have to work that hard. You just have to do the right things every day to progress you towards your goal. So habits are tough, though, aren't they? They're really tough. How do you, how do you break that runaway train habit that you might have? And I realize we haven't got a lot well, of time. And the other one is, what about when st sometimes we, we have almost like two personalities, don't we? We have this <laughs> kind of like, there's there's a bit of us that really wants to go for things. And then there's another bit of go, going, oh, you can't do that. Well, there's a number of different points there. And I could talk about each of them for a long time. So I'll, I'll try and summarize them. Um, the secret to, I mean, when I talked about 
successful people do the things that unsuccessful people don't do, even though they don't like doing them. Willpower will take you a certain distance, but not very far. That's why people set New Year's resolutions and three weeks later they're drinking again or eating burgers again or what have you. Because um, willpower will only last a certain period of time. If you want to um, continue with those good habits to introduce, you really need a good reason why. Simon Sinek talks about the reason why a lot and you know something other people do as well. But take for example, many people try and go on a diet, you know, and you're successful for a period of time, but people on diets generally fail. But what about if you're a Hollywood movie star who's offered the part in a film if you and you will earn $20 million or whatever they earn these days, but you have to lose X number of pounds and bulk up your body or whatever they have to do. I would imagine that $20 million payday is going to give you a big enough reason why to eat your steamed fish and steamed vegetables and go to the gym every day for an hour for six months because you've got a motivating factor. Now, to move on to your second point, the reason why that little devil on the shoulder is so prominent is we are all programmed just in the way computer programs are, um, are made. And we're controlled by what we call paradigms. And paradigms are basically a multitude of habits and beliefs. And they are designed to avoid anything fearful. They're designed to keep you in your comfort zone. So it's really hard to get out of your comfort zone. You need to be able to kind of conquer the fear because whenever you try and get out of your comfort zone, that paradigm kicks in, the fear kicks in, it's telling you, no, no, don't do that, don't do that, and invents all sorts of reasons why you shouldn't do it. Um, and you really just, you have to learn, this is one of the things I, I coach people through my program, how to find the courage to break through that. And when you do break through that, and you realize you've done it, guess what? It builds your confidence. And next time it occurs, because it never stops occurring, but you will have the past experience of having successfully broken out of your comfort zone previously, realized the world didn't end, and you can do it again and again and again, and it becomes a lot easier. So, you know, I think it was um, Robert Russell who said, habit is God's way of making good automatic. And, we all have bad habits. No, yeah, I've got plenty. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's difficult. You can't just stop the bad habits because nature abhors a vacuum. If you stop a bad habit, um, you know, say you're an alcoholic, you've probably seen films, you know, people in AA, they stop, they stop drinking, but they start drinking a lot more coffee or smoking a lot of cigarettes. You have to replace a bad habit with, with something um, new and the, the best way to do that um, we found is you write a list out of um, say your top five non-productive habits those things you know you're doing that aren't getting you the results that you want and then you think right well how could I change those what what actions could I take to get me the results I want and you fill out your productive actions and then quite simply, you, you burn those non-productive actions or shred them or do something with them. So symbolically, you destroy them in your subconscious mind. And every day you write out, and it's a process of strategic repetition, you write out the productive actions and you follow through on them. And probably what, what do one or two at a time is the best way to do it. Because if you try and do too much, you'll, well, certainly in my experience, it just all falls down. So it's a very good idea to layer these new habits you're trying to create and just do one one at a time but you work on implementing those productive actions into your life one at a time and at first it'll be hard and it becomes a little bit easier and then before you know it you don't even think about it you're doing them every day so it, it can be done by a very very simple process and the reason why habits are so powerful and, and kind of big, kind of exciting actions or having a big idea like I, I thought was the key to it early on, don't work, is this. Um, there's an example in Darren Hardy's book where he explains that, you know, for three three guys and um, if you, I'll simplify it. If you eat a big, if you eat a Big Mac meal, okay, yep. you're not gonna get obese and die of a heart attack. 
you know if you have one a month you're probably not going to get obese and die of a heart attack but if you eat that same big mac meal every single day yeah you probably won't notice any change for six months after a year you'll pretty much notice you've put on quite a few pounds and after three or four years you're going to be pretty obese okay so it just builds up over time and by whatever habits you've got whether they're good habits or bad habits incrementally they build up and build up and gather momentum and there's an exponential effect um, at the end of it you know so good habits will lead you on an upward curve bad habits on a downward curve and you need to make sure you've got good habits in place before it's too late and everything you're saying here phrase is making total sense and and i get it but there's still a lot of people running around on planet earth today knowing what you're saying and doing the opposite why do you think that is the case that some people know that it's a bit like the odds of winning the lottery are so slim that people <laughs> buy a ticket every week and i don't mean just for the you know it's a thing to do i mean like why do you think people have that they know that you know fad diets and um uh big splurge on business like the latest win women business um why do you think people still do that even though they know that in their in their gut that's that's not the way i think it's down to conditioning um and what they'd like to believe because if uh, take an example you consciously you consciously know for example that you have a one in 14 million chance of winning the lottery but subconsciously your your belief system is you know maybe you could be the one and that's probably what that you know the advertisers play into because your subconscious mind is you know many 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 times more powerful i forget the statistic but maybe, maybe 100 times more powerful than your conscious mind which means it's always going to win so if you want to affect any sort of change in your life you have to do it on the subconscious level um not your conscious level and you have to do that by questioning your beliefs so you have to say where what you know where did i get these beliefs from do they come from my parents my teachers my peers at school um something i've read the media um and are they really true because if you start to question the things you just accept as being true in your life you'll you'll quite often realize there's no real basis for believing what you believe um and if, the fact of the matter is, if there's no real basis for believing it, you can shift your beliefs and decide to believe something that's more empowering, that helps you. And this is particularly prevalent with you know, people who tell themselves, oh, they can't do something or they're not good enough to do something. It's just rubbish. Mm -hmm. you know, money in particular is something people have very misguided beliefs about. Um, you know, I, I certainly have my issues with, with money, as I think a lot of people do. You know, I brought up with comments like oh you know money doesn't grow on trees we can't afford that um you've got to work really hard if you want to earn money um they're just just things like that that are detrimental to your beliefs but they're not true i mean if you grew up in a elon musk's household as one of his 10 million children um or richard branson i think he's almost got an equally large um brood you would have very different views about money than you probably have growing up in the environment you did do yeah and their beliefs about money are his richard branson's children's beliefs about money are probably they're no more true than your beliefs about money okay. um but theirs are a lot more empowering they probably believe sorry not meaning you particularly dean but um, no, I, I, they, they, I, I, they believe I mean, they can achieve anything they believe money comes easily and jeff bezos made 30 billion dollars in one day you know mm -hmm. that sort of thing is possible if you believe it is and you put yourself in an environment where those sorts of things happen but it's not going to happen if you you think that the the pinnacle of your achievement is is earning 12 dollar 12 quid an hour doing whatever it is you're doing yeah you're right There's, there is a difference isn't there between people who say i could i can do that and then people who go okay i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna back that statement with action absolutely kind of you know jeff bezos decided to list amazon based on his belief of what could happen but if he was like no what happens if what happens if he wouldn't do it no 
Well, people, people are often afraid to make decisions. Again, that's another really critical factor in what separates those people who are successful from those people who are not. It's the ability to assess all the available information and having the courage to make a decision. Now, it might not always be the right decision, but making a decision is better than not making a decision. And, you know, if it, you don't know if it, you, you can't foresee the future. You don't know if it's going to turn out all right or not. You simply have no idea. You make the best decision you can based on the information available at the time. And if it turns out to be wrong, you admit your mistake, you pivot, you change, you retract, whatever you do. But you've got to progress forward. You have to make decisions. Mm -hmm. So um, what are some of the what are some of the actions that will help people build confidence around that? You know, they're changing those habits. They're doing those things. What are some of the actions that they can take? Well, um, how successful you are in life is really determined by your, your, your self-image. You know, you can never outperform your self-image. So one thing I like to do with clients is kind of adopt a Daniel Day-Lewis, Robert De Niro type thing, becoming a method actor and really practice seeing, thinking, feeling and acting like the person you want to become. And if you do that, you will start to adopt those characteristics. There's, you know, a lot of people think, you know, when, when they become successful, they'll be, or money will make them happy or they'll become a certain sort of person. That's not the way it works. You attract to you who you are and you need to become the sort of person who, who is successful and is wealthy in order to attract that to you. Um, so one, improve your self-image. You can, uh, you know, do the method acting thing, really involve yourself. And that's a great book by Stella Act. Um, Stella Adler called The Art of Acting. She's great for, Stella Adler was Marlon Brando's acting teacher. Um, that's a really good book for learning how to do that and really getting into the character. Um, just the way you dress, I know we live in a very casual society these days, but if you want to G yourself up and make yourself feel more successful, then, then dress the part. Um, number three, develop more empowering beliefs, which is what we talked about you know is it really true you can't do what you're telling yourself you, you can't do i doubt it you know we're we all capable um, of achieving much much more than we believe i mean back in the this is just one example maybe a bit too too old for many of these listeners many of you listeners but back in the 1960s it was thought doctors were unanimous that it was physiologically impossible to run a four minute mile but one doctor, Roger Bannister, decided he was going to do it. And he did manage to break the four minute mile, which was just a complete shock to the medical community. And once he'd done it, suddenly everyone's belief system about what was possible changed. And 20 or 30 people in quick succession all managed to break the four minute mile. There's been many, many research studies with children in schools who are basically not performing well but all of a sudden their teachers are told to praise them, give them falsely high marks um, for a term or, or whatever. And once the children start to believe in themselves, once they start to see themselves as successful, guess what? They start paying attention, they start enjoying learning more, and they actually start to do better because they have that belief in themselves. So an exercise you can do for that is, you know, write out all your strengths and weaknesses. One column your strengths, the other column your weaknesses, and then cross out all your weaknesses, ignore them. Nobody's good at everything. You know, I, I think I'm great at starting businesses and getting ideas off the ground, but I'm rubbish at, you know, I wouldn't know where to start if my car broke down or you know, putting up a shelf in my house or, well, I'm good at cookery actually, I love, I love cooking, but you know, we're all, good at, we're all good at certain things. And there's no point, you know, school, that's why school's so screwed up. They tried to make you, raise all your marks and everything. I had no interest in chemistry. I had no interest in German. You know, I got A's in the subjects I liked and didn't do well in the ones I didn't like. I don't want to be good at everything. I want to be good at the things I enjoy doing. So if you focus on your strengths, then guess what? You become better at them. It builds your confidence and you're more successful. So I would advise everyone to write out what they consider the strengths are and focus on those. Um, Number four, and I, I, I just think this is something everyone should do because it just makes the world a better place despite the, uh, in, on top of the benefits it has for yourself. But train yourself to see the good 
in everybody and everything. Just stop complaining, stop picking people to pieces, start to look for the good in people, pay them sincere compliments. And not only will your world become a much more pleasant place, but because you start to see good in people, that's really a reflection of, I believe, of the good in yourself and it will make you realize you are a good person it will make you more confident in yourself so that's a really really great thing to do i mean i've i've been with relatives i hope they don't watch this in the last few days i'm not joking and they're not unusual in this but literally they spend their entire conversations complaining about people and things that have happened to them the airports the travel the food at a restaurant the service they got it's just a litany of complaints and they're reliving these situations and making themselves annoyed and frustrated all over again. Why? <laughs> it's just pointless. Um, you know, it's like we all do it to an extent. You get cut off in traffic and you, you know, you're angry about it. For ages. just forget it. You don't know what's going on in that person's life. You might be a perfectly nice person, just happen to be not paying attention at that moment. Um, so always just train yourself to see the good in everybody and everything. Um, I touched on this when we talked about purpose. Um, fifth thing I would do is just work out what your values are in life, what it is that you believe in, not what you've been told is right or wrong, what you should do, or what you know what would be a good career or what's the right thing to do. Work out what your values are. You know, is it integrity, loyalty, honesty, justice, truth, wisdom, whatever your values are, and commit yourself to living in alignment with them. So every decision you have to make, you make it not what's expedient, not what's going to make you money, not what's going to make you the quick buck or just easier to do. You live in alignment with your values. And the more you do that, again, the more confidence you will build, the more sure you are of yourself, of the actions you take, because you know what to do in every situation. There's no uncertainty. Um, habits, we talked about that. When you change your habits and you successfully change a habit, certainly I feel a sense of accomplishment. I, I have in, introduced so many habits, um, positive habits into my life over the past three or four years, just very slowly, one at a time. Um, so I, I go for an early morning, morning walk. I get up at five o'clock. I go for an early morning walk. I exercise every single day by the playing tennis, going to the gym or, or doing my walk. Um, I think I've dropped the I sort of dropped the cold showers if I'm being honest, but I did do that for a while, and I, I probably will get back into it. Um, in terms of business, the most effective habit I've ever introduced is um, a method called the Ivy Lee Ivy Lee method, which is a, a way of prioritizing your most important tasks and just working through them one at a time. And that is far and away the best habit you can introduce in your business to really accelerate its growth. Um, and I think if you do that, you will see a remarkable change in yourself over a period of 12 months. And if you do want to introduce one habit a month for 12 months, you will be a completely different and much improved person in a year's time. And then seventh thing I would say to improve your confidence is start taking decisive action. Because when you take action, you have experiences that leads to knowledge. And as you build up your knowledge, you develop more confidence. Confidence is essentially knowledge. You know, we start, you, you talked earlier about um, learning to drive a car. Well, no one's confident when they start to learn to drive a car. But as your experience and your knowledge grows, your confidence builds. And now I imagine you, you drive a car and you, you change gears without swerving into the curb, without even thinking about the curb. Or even um, arrive in places where you don't even remember how you got there. <laughs> Oh, yeah, exactly. Because you've built up that knowledge and you're probably a very confident driver. So knowledge breeds confidence. So take decisive action, get experience, study, 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 study. You know, the best way you can improve yourself, prove your confidence and be more successful is by studying and personal development on yourself. Make yourself a more valuable person to the marketplace, to your customers, to your staff, everybody. Okay, I realise we're running out of time, so I'm speeding up a bit there. I hope we're yeah. going too fast. <laughs> it's all right. I've nudged my five o'clock, so we're all right for a little bit. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> uh, 
and that's that's it in terms of the comp the comfort seven comfort seven tips for confidence building okay so so fraser when who is it you work with well the program i i run i'm, I'm a I'm, I'm, I'm a trained kind of business success consultant with an organization called Proctor Gallagher Institute, which um, is founded by Bob Proctor, my, my mentor. So the program is called Thinking Into Results. It's basically about a complete change of your, your mindset in various different aspects. Now, it works really for anybody, um, for any aspect of their life. But personally, with my background, um, as I said, I think at the start of this interview, I believe entrepreneurs are the real heroes of our economy and because of my background i'm focused specifically on helping entrepreneurs and founders um you know company directors um, managing directors people like that essentially create the right mindset for business success and to scale their companies so essentially entrepreneurs and, and founders and ceos people like that okay and and how how does this how because obviously some people will be listening to this they may not have met you they may not know much about you how does this work in terms of how does what you do unlock the success in the business what's the connection between the mindset how do you can draw those connections well i think when people start a business they can they can they can just take it to a certain level they can get it off the ground take it to a certain level but then their self-limiting beliefs kick in um they they're perhaps not focused on doing the right things um they may be having difficulty to hire and retain the right staff um all, all the, they may they may not have the belief in themselves that they can get themselves to the next level the subconscious belief even though they tell themselves they can um you know i think i touched on this earlier it's 80 percent mindset and the thing that stops most business owners from reaching their goals and getting to the seven figure level or beyond that is their psychology you know it's changing if they want to be successful it's not about doing more work it's not about implementing more marketing systems it's it's not about finding new products to sell or finding more customers even you know you, you can keep the same number of customers and increase their lifetime value there's all sorts of things you can do but fundamentally if you don't have the right foundations in place if you don't have the right mindset all those things are being built on a very shaky foundation okay um outside of business and all of those other things what are the things that you get up to Fraser what are the things that really uh, you know we talked about purpose outside yeah. of business what do you love doing well reading and studying I just love learning um but I love cooking quite into my cooking are you um, really so good at it <laughs> uh, people seem to think so I mean I'm not I, I wouldn't put myself onto master chef I mean God the standard on that show is amazing but um yeah, I, I, I cook very nice meals. My secret is just be really generous with all, all the portions, <laughs> of the, all, all the things you like, and put more and more in of those. Um, but the thing I've spent most of my time doing, and this ties in very nicely with one of my new clients, is um, I, I love playing tennis. I play tennis four or five times a week. And my tennis coach actually coaches um, a couple of professional tennis players, one of whom has won Wimbledon a couple of times. And um, I'm actually about to just agree to deal with them to start working with them to um, build an online tennis academy. So really, really excited about that. So that combines my one of my real passion, well, two of my passions, building businesses um, with tennis. So I'm really excited about that. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Um, Fraser, where's the best? What's the best way people can get in touch with you? Um, well, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, I'm on, it's LinkedIn.com forward slash Fraser, F-R-A-Z-E-R, Fernhead, F-E-A-R-N-H-E-A-D. Or um, I've got various websites. Probably the best one is bluesilver.solutions. Bluesilver.solutions. Yeah. And on there, um, your program, um, Thinking Into Results, um, what's the duration of it? Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's typically a six month, it's, it's initially a six month program. And then there's a kind of business mastery, um, sorry, business mastermind program 
that leads on for that, which deals with, as I said, mindset 80%, business mastery thing after that six month program deals with um, all your kind of business development, kind of um, your, your practical aspects of building and growing a business. And is it a one-to-one -one program? How does it work? Um, Thinking to Results is essentially, um, it's delivered by Bob Proctor via video. Bob unfortunately um, passed away earlier this year, but the videos, um, still great um 12 video modules delivered by him big workbook with lots of exercises um and anecdotes and illustrations in there and then it's facilitated by me via weekly online grouping um online group coaching sessions and also monthly one-to-one -one laser coaching sessions where um i will help people with any aspect of their mindset or or their business Awesome. Fraser, you've been a star. Um, thank you so much for coming on. Um, I really appreciate um, you, you know, totally unscripted. You didn't know what I was going to say. So I think that's the best way to do it because you really find out what people know. And, you know, you've given us a lot of good and useful stuff today. So thank you so much for coming on. Um, if you want to go check out Fraser, I'll put his LinkedIn URL here somewhere. If you're interested in his program or you're interested in what he does, drop him a message. I know um, you'll happily jump on a 15 minute intro call with people, right, Fraser? Yeah, I love, love chatting to people. Um, just, you know, it's never any hard sell. It's jump on a 15 minute call, have a quick chat, see if, um, you know, it's a good fit and whether whether it's you're suitable for the program. If, if then we'll, we'll set up a, a, further, a further strategy call where we go into it in more depth. Awesome. Fraser, thanks again. And uh, yeah. everybody, do check out um, the episode on uh, LinkedIn. Go see um, Fraser on his profile. And you can also subscribe to this on Spotify, Amazon Prime, iTunes, or wherever it is as well. So thanks for joining us this session. And again, thanks to Fraser for, for braving my unscripted interview. Thanks, Dean. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much.